Hello, this is Dr. Gonday. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Keith Jesperson and Laverne Pavlinak? Jesperson is also known as the happy face killer. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll take a look at the background of Keith Chesperson and his crimes, move to Laverne Pavlinak, then offer my analysis. Keith Chesperson was born in British Columbia, Canada on April 6, 1955. His father was named Les and his mother, Gladys. Keith had two brothers and two sisters. He was the middle child. His father used alcohol excessively and was violent. Keith and his family moved to a trailer park in Washington State when he was young. Keith was physically larger than normal. He was often teased by his peers. They called him names like Igor and Baby Huey. He spent a lot of time alone as a child. He would often violate society's norms. He committed a number of crimes. Starting sometime around age five or six, Keith tortured and killed small animals on a regular basis including crows, gophers, cats, and dogs. When Keith was nine years old, he punched and kicked a 16-year-old who was approaching him after Keith insulted the teenager's mother. When he was around 10 years old, Keith attempted to murder a boy that he knew. He would try to kill another boy by drowning him in a swimming pool not long after this. Keith started shoplifting sometime around 13 or 14. He shot a neighbor in the genitals with a BB gun, he shot another neighbor who was bending over. He also shot a teacher with an arrow fitted with an exploding tip. Keith attended high school. He tried to find romance there, but was unsuccessful. He never went to a school dance. He did not attend his prom. Despite his failures at romance, after he graduated in 1973, he did manage to find a romantic interest. Her name was Rose. The couple would get married in 1975 and go on to have three children. Keith found work driving a truck, a job he did for many years. The couple divorced in 1990, after Rose suspected Keith of having multiple affairs. Rose would eventually become a social worker. She died of cancer in April of 2021. Keith decided that he wanted to join the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He was accepted for training, but was injured. So he moved back to Cheney, Washington. He found another job as a truck driver. Now moving to the timeline of Keith Jesperson's crimes. On January 23, 1990, Keith met a 23-year-old woman named Tana Bennett at a bar in Oregon. According to Keith, when he walked into the bar, Bennett approached him and hugged him as if she had known him for a long time. This is something that was consistent with her normal behavior. She was highly extroverted, extremely affectionate, and promiscuous. Bennett was also intellectually disabled. This particular characteristic was exciting to Keith. Keith invited her back to his residence to have sex. Bennett indicated that she was not getting excited and told Keith to just get it over with. Keith would later say that this was reminiscent of what other women had told him, and he became angry. He punched Bennett in the head several times, strangled her, and dumped her body in the woods. This murder connects over to the story of Laverne Pavlinak, which I'll get to in a few moments. Keith would continue to murder women. He killed a woman named Claudia in California sometime in July or August of 1992. In September of that same year, he killed a sex worker who climbed in his truck even after he told her he wasn't interested in sex. This was also in California. His fourth murder took place in Oregon. He killed a sex worker who had tried to double the price of her services and threatened to call the police if he did not pay. In June of 1993, he murdered a woman in California. His sixth murder occurred in 1994, this time in Florida. In January of 1995, Keith agreed to take a young woman from the state of Washington to Colorado to see her father. The woman changed her mind during the trip and said she wanted to go to Indiana to see a friend. While sleeping in a truck stop in Wyoming, he said the woman kept pressuring him to drive in bad weather. He strangled her and went back to sleep. He dumped her body in Nebraska. His final murder would occur on March 10, 1995. He strangled his fiancée, 
Julie Winningham in the state of Washington. This was the only murder that he committed where there was some type of connection to the victim. The police arrested him on March 22 to ask him questions, but he refused to talk to them. They did not have enough evidence to hold him, so he was released. Believing that he was destined to be arrested, Keith attempted to bring an end to his own life the day he was released and tried a second time the day after that. He used pills on both occasions. On March 24, Keith wrote a letter to his brother confessing to the murders. He then confessed to the police that he had murdered eight women in six different states over a five-year period. Keith would eventually claim that he had killed 160 people, although he later recanted those confessions. Only eight homicides were confirmed. In late 1995, he was convicted and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. In 2010, he was convicted in California of another murder and received a fourth life sentence. The intersection of Keith Jesperson with Laverne Pavlinak occurs around the murder of Tawana Bennett. Again, we see this was Keith's first murder victim. He met her in a bar. Something very unusual happened in this particular case. A 57-year-old woman named Laverne Pavlinak lived in Oregon not far from where Bennett was killed. She read a lot of books about mysteries and true crime and was fascinated with police procedures, some of which she learned on the television show Matlock. Laverne took a specific interest in the Bennett case. She read newspaper articles and watched television news reports to learn as much as she could about the case. Laverne did this because she wanted to get rid of her 43-year-old live-in boyfriend, a man named John Sosnovsky. Her plan was to falsely accuse John of killing Bennett by giving the police all the details she learned from various reports. Laverne had a habit of falsely accusing John. She would regularly call his probation officer and make up stories to get him in trouble. Often this happened after they had an argument. Laverne called the police and told them the story about how John killed Bennett. She fabricated physical evidence. For example, she gave the police a piece of material ripped from a pair of jeans which appeared to match a piece missing from Bennett's jeans. The police checked it out and realized it was not authentic. Laverne changed her story several times. During her final story, she suggested that she had actually helped kill Bennett by strangling her with a rope. So now she was involved in the crime, not just accusing John, but she took an active role, and it was her behavior with the rope that actually caused Bennett's death. Again, this is according to Laverne's story. John initially denied being involved in the murder, but then, strangely, made up the story about how he saw someone else with Bennett's dead body in their vehicle. The police arrested both Laverne and John. Laverne was convicted of murder based only on her confession and information that she had which was not public. In reality, Laverne collected her information from news reports and from a search warrant that she looked at when the police were with her like she was being sneaky, like they turned away for a moment and she looked at what they had written in the search warrant. The police were also amazed that she was able to point out where Bennett's body was dumped. Laverne figured it out from seeing tracks around the area. She knew the general area from the news. She was able to find the specific location because the police had been in and out of the area so much that it was disturbed. Laverne was sentenced to a minimum of 10 years in prison after being convicted. John was frightened about receiving the death penalty, especially after Laverne was convicted. He agreed to a plea bargain, where he had to serve a minimum of 15 years. As the couple was sitting in prison, Keith Jesperson left a couple of messages accompanied by happy faces in bathroom stalls, suggesting that he was the real killer. When that effort to gain credit for Bennett's murder was unsuccessful, he wrote letters to a newspaper in Oregon. After he was arrested, DNA on a stamp linked Keith to the letters. He showed the police where he dumped Bennett's purse. They didn't find her purse, but they did find her ID. So now the police believed that Keith Jesperson was actually the killer. They realized that Laverne and John were not involved. Laverne and John were released from prison in November of 1995, although the judge gave Laverne a hard time about misusing the courts. Laverne would die of heart failure on March 4, 2003, at age 70. John died in 2013. 
Now moving to my analysis. For this first part of this analysis, I'll look at Keith Jesperson, then I'll look at the situation with Laverne and John. Keith Jesperson manifested all the classic signs of a serial killer. He tortured small animals. This is something he did to a greater extent than many other serial killers. He sustained a head injury, specifically when he was climbing a rope during his police training in Canada, and the bracket holding the rope snapped. Keith weighed about 240 pounds. He had a fascination with fire. In addition, he was fascinated with explosives and cannons. Keith was the victim of mistreatment when he was young, not just by his father, but by his peers. And Keith was isolated and socially awkward. Looking at his history, it's not incredibly surprising that he became a serial killer. I think what is unusual about Keith is how he was able to maintain employment and for the most part avoided problems with the law even though he committed a phenomenal number of crimes before he committed murder. He was arrested at least once prior to being arrested for murder. The police said he attacked a woman, but he was not convicted of the charge. In the letter that Keith wrote to his brother, he appeared to show some remorse. He did not want to continue to be a killer. This is highly unusual. Most serial killers don't have any remorse. If anything, they are kind of proud of their accomplishments. If Keith had discontinued his homicidal activity after killing his fiancée and failed to confess, he probably never would have been convicted for the crimes. I think at some level Keith knew he could not resist killing again. No amount of remorse is ever going to make up for what he did, and of course many people don't believe he is being genuine, but I think it's reasonable to believe that he did want to stop killing. Later, Keith would change his tune a bit, saying it was unfair for him to be in prison for life for what he referred to as eight days of insanity, meaning society should overlook the eight murders he committed because they were committed on just those eight days. This defense is as novel as it is ridiculous. By this logic, any crime is okay as long as the offender doesn't take too long to commit it. Now moving on to Laverne Pavlinak. In many ways, Laverne's case is more extraordinary than the case of Keith Jesperson. The mystery here is why would anybody do what she did? Laverne said that her motive was to prevent her boyfriend, John, from mistreating her. It appears as though she was willing to go to prison for a short time to get him in prison for a long time. Laverne discovered that prison was not as pleasant as she imagined. She wanted to get out desperately as soon as she was in there. I think Laverne simply had no idea what she was doing. She developed a sense of false confidence by learning about true crime from articles and television. She dealt with the police as if it was a game, and she learned the hard way that it was not. John's behavior was peculiar as well. He had a long history of criminality, including multiple DUIs. Many people felt as though prison was really the best place for him, and therefore they weren't really too worried about him being falsely convicted. John was not good at dealing with the police. It's not clear why he told them the story about Bennett's dead body being with a friend. It doesn't make any sense. He implicated himself after remaining silent for so long. It's almost like the pressure was getting to him, and he felt like he had to give the police something to distract them, to make them not focus on him. I think a few lessons can be learned in this case. First lesson, confessions are highly valued by juries. Laverne's confession was not corroborated. All the information she shared with the police was available in media reports and from her being sneaky. She didn't actually know anything about the case that only the killer would have known. Second lesson, once somebody is convicted, it is very hard to get that overturned. Laverne and John's freedom hinged on the police finding Bennett's ID on a hillside after Keith pointed out the general area where he disposed of the victim's purse and its contents. If that ID had never been found, if a bird had flew off with it, if a hiker had found it and put it in their pocket, or if a squirrel had taken it to build a nest, Laverne and John would have stayed in prison. Sometimes justice hinges on the decisions of a squirrel. Third lesson, members of society cannot always prevent the development of serial killers, but they can control their own actions. Many of the people murdered by Keith were taking incredible risks at the time. That doesn't mean they were responsible for what happened to them, 
but it does mean that there was a way available for them to prevent their deaths. Similarly, Laverne was convicted because of her own false statements. She had a clear way to avoid prison. Don't accuse anybody falsely and don't confess. Fourth lesson, sometimes when looking at this case, people think of Laverne as a victim. Her conviction was the result of an overzealous prosecution. The police didn't handle the investigation properly. She was really just innocent in this whole situation. Clearly mistakes were made in her case, but Laverne was not completely innocent. Her actions convinced law enforcement that they had closed Bennett's case. They thought it was solved. In reality, of course, Keith was the killer, and he would go on to kill seven more women. Laverne was guilty of derailing the investigation. In addition, Laverne falsely accused her boyfriend of murder. It doesn't matter that he had committed other crimes. The system should not falsely convict somebody in order to make them pay for other offenses. I think she should have been convicted of that charge and sentenced to prison. It is difficult to see Laverne as a victim when she was actually victimizing someone else. Those are my thoughts on the case of the Happy Face Killer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.